the spring and summer of 2013, working as an undergraduate assistant to a professor who is conducting research on determining what has hindered positive environmental policy around the world, particulars, particularly focusing on the effects of corporate lobbying efforts. In addition to his understanding of policy, his environmental studies minor has provided him with a background in the science of climate change. So welcome for it. Great, thank you so much for coming out. Um, I want to thank, first of all, the ESS uh, and the BC Talks team. I think they really put on a great operation here. I'm really excited to be able to participate. I'm a political science and environmental studies major and minor, so I've been studying climate change to some degree pretty much my entire time at BC and ever since high school. So I'm really excited to finally be able to present some of my findings, uh, some of the things that I've discovered. Um, so thinking big on a smaller level, how local governments can help solve climate change. I want to start by talking about first saying that I truly believe that climate change is the single greatest existential crisis that humanity faces today and probably has ever faced. And I don't want to be an alarmist. I'm not here to fear monger. I don't want to scare you into agreeing with me and joining my side and like going to rallies and stuff. But the evidence that's been presented to me proves to me beyond a doubt that this is the case and we have to do something about it and we have to do something fast. But if you're still not convinced, I'm gonna do a quick background on why I'm so convinced, convinced of this. So this is the assumption that I'm working on. Climate change is happening and we are responsible for it. We're the ones at fault. NASA estimates about 97% of climate scientists agree that the global warming that has occurred on this planet in the past 100 years is a, a very likely a result of our activities. So what are these, some of these organizations that believe this? American Physical Society, American Chemical Society, American Meteorological Society, pretty much American, a field of science, society, they believe that climate change has been happening for years. The only exception to that rule being the American Petroleum Institute, that's a whole other issue that I can't get into today. If you don't trust scientists for some reason, let's see what the economists have to say. The World Bank, some of the most famous, most renowned ex economists in the entire planet, they make it pretty clear. The science is unequivocal that humans are the cause of global warming and major changes are already being observed. These are your free market laissez-faire capitalists over here telling you this. Now, to play on that point of the, the free market capitalists, Insurance companies historically have sided with the Chamber of Commerce and very traditionally fiscally conservative organizations. They hate government regulation like the devil. They run away from it at any chance that they can get. But recently, a very exciting change has been happening that I think has been very underreported. So insurance companies, because they manage risk, that's what they do. They have to plan for the future, and especially when it comes to natural disasters, because they're the ones that are footing the bill. After Hurricane Sandy, they had to pay billions and billions of dollars out of their pockets to cover the damages that occurred. So they're viewing the science and they're saying, wait guys, this is actually a real thing that's happening. So US Chamber of Commerce, we can't really side with you that much anymore. They're starting to push for government regulation, for cap and trade, for taxing carbon emissions, because they understand that if they don't, their entire economic structure is going to crumble. They can't handle Superstorm Sandy once, twice, three times every single year. They're going to crumble and they're going to fall apart. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to see the insurance companies tomorrow, you know, in a partnership with the Sierra Club. They're not, they're, they haven't been that vocal about it. But it's an interesting trend to notice and I, I encourage some of you to check it out if you can. Here's what it comes down to. Bloomberg Business Week, it's global warming, stupid. And this was directly after Hurricane Sandy, and they just really hit you over the head with what's going on. Now, no scientist can tell you, okay, Sandy was because of climate change or any particular event is because of climate change. But the trends that we see occurring, the increase in the frequency of these superstorms, the extent of the damage that they cause, it's only gonna keep increasing. So sometimes it takes some alarmist journalism like Business Week put out here to really let you know what's going on. But there's hope. Um, well, before I go on, 
there are a few things before. I want to make it clear, okay? The science behind climate change is not undebatable in every single circumstance. There are some things that scientists aren't clear about. For example, the extent of the damage that's going to occur. No one really knows how many of these storms are going to happen, what's the damage that they're going to cost. Most people agree that it's going to be terrible, but we don't really know how terrible it's going to be. We also don't know the time frame. We don't know when this is going to start occurring more frequently. It could be in 10 years, hopefully not. Um, could be in 50 years, could be in 100 years. But if we don't do anything about it, scientists agree that it's inevitable that this is going to occur. And finally, we don't know what the point of no return is. I don't know if some of you maybe have seen uh, Bill McKibben speak or seen something of his organization. He was here a couple weeks ago. He says that the safe zone for the planet is 350 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Currently, we're at about 400, so we're not really there yet. But scientists in general don't really agree what that turning point is. What's that point of no return? Where can we no longer, where, at which point, are we just screwed? Sorry. Um, so, which brings me, you know, I want to get hopeful, but before I get hopeful, let's get darker. The current situation with international climate negotiations. It's a dismal state of affairs. I'm not gonna, there's been, you know, conferences in Copenhagen, in Doha this past year. There was actually a BC student that got to go with the Sierra Club, which was really cool. Um, you know, conferences are held all the time. No agreements have been reached. Now, instead of boring you with all the details, I want to share an added anecdote that I picked up a couple of weeks ago from a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School of Public Policy. He was, um, he was on the Obama administration's team at the Copenhagen conference in 2009. This is the story he tells. So there's several hours left in negotiations. Not a single agreement has been reached. In fact, all the diplomatic teams are split up into smaller groups and they're discussing all the little details and they have no conclusions. <laughs> Their working paper that they were about to present had one open bracket before the first word and one closing bracket after the last word, which made it less of a working paper and more of like a working paper. Not a single thing was agreed on. So in his despair, the chairman of the committee calls together everyone from their smaller breakout groups, and he says, okay, we're gonna try this one last time. We're gonna do speeches, we're gonna go into formal debate. Now before I call the first delegation up, I want you guys to focus on the positives. Don't tell me what you disagree on, I want you to tell me if we can walk away here and save a little bit of face. Don't embarrass us, please. So the delegates carefully listen to that. The first delegation is called up to the stand and they start to speak. This delegation believes that another set of brackets needs to be entered in the third paragraph and the second sentence because that is completely against what we stand for and we won't stand for this and we hate this document. <laughs> Needless to say, This is where Copenhagen left us. At some point, you know, it's settled. We agree to sign a pledge to hold another meeting to consider changing course at a date yet to be determined. <laughs> Nothing. So what do we do? There is hope. There are solutions. Scientists have developed ways that we can combat climate change. The science is out there. Energy efficiency. Um, renewable energies. Even nuclear power. Now, I know nuclear power is like heavily contested and very controversial, and I'd love to talk to you guys on some other date about why I believe nuclear power is going to be necessary if we're going to have a serious transition, but I don't have time for that, unfortunately. Come seek me out, and I have lots to say. Um, so what do we do? Unite local governments. This is already happening today. In the Northeast United States, there's the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, RGGI. It was started in the mid-2000s. There's New York, New Jersey, even though New Jersey dropped out under Christie, um, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and a bunch of other states. And they came together and they actually agreed on a voluntary approach to cap and trade. So they're gonna cap carbon emissions from their power plants and they're gonna sell off permits to those emissions on a free market. Great idea. And it's actually been working really well. In February of 2013, they tightened the restrictions. So now every single year, 2014, 2015, all the way through 2020, emissions are going to be reduced by 2.5% every single year. And that adds up. And that's only until 2020. It's probably only going to get better from there. Cities, Boston, 
has been focusing and pushing for renewable energies. Philadelphia had a great program a few years ago with affordable housing and, and energy efficiency. By subsidizing um, public housing to build much more energy efficient homes and thereby saving the state and those inhabitants money. It was fantastic. So what we do now is we take together these smaller actors that obviously want to see a change but may not always have the opportunity to do so or may not always have the resources or the know-how to move forward and we need to bring them together. And how do we do that? Well, there's already uh, an, organiza an organization that exists. It's called United Cities and Local Governments. And what they do is they gather every year. There's, over, there's thousands of cities worldwide that are involved in it. And what they do is they come together and they talk about issues of local governance and a bunch of stuff that's not climate change is basically what I got out of it. And what we need to do, what I'm here to push for, is we need to make the resources that are used by environmental organizations today, the lobbying efforts that they put forth at, or, at um, conferences like Copenhagen and like Doha, and put those resources to use to unite the local governments. Now, we're still going to need the national governments and their diplomats that have failed thus far. But before we do that, we're going to build from the ground up. We're going to build support in the cities that want to do something. We're going to achieve actual change by reducing emissions in the next two to three years. But the most important point is that we're going to put pressure on, the, on our national governments to finally go to one of these conferences and end up with an agreement that we can work with and something that we can implement. I want to end my talk today by talking about a quote that's been very important for me recently. From those to whom much is given, much will be expected. And that works out in two ways. The first way is on a personal level. So for all of you that are in this room, we have all been very blessed and privileged in a lot of, a lot, a lot of ways, just by the fact of you being here today. And I hope that you realize that you carry a responsibility and a duty to use those resources, to use the tools that you've been given, and to really make a change in the world in whatever way you can. Maybe my 15-minute speech today hopefully inspired you to take a stand on climate change, but maybe not. Maybe you have some other causes that are very important for you, and that's great. But it works on a second level, too. Industrialized countries as a whole have benefited greatly and grown economically because we have pumped out so much carbon into the system. We are the ones that are responsible for most of what's going on in climate change today. And that's changing with you know, India and China and stuff, but the fact remains that we currently are responsible for the most amount of emissions which means that the onus falls on us to act. Because for those to whom much has been given, much will be expected. Thank you. <laughs>